Good morning, second service. He, uh, he calls himself a pastor jerkface. He posts stuff on social media, mostly um, jokes and satire and, and sarcasm, and his stated goal is saying out loud what he says most preachers allegedly wish they could say but somehow feel like they can't. And I find some of his stuff quite humorous. And recently, he described how some preachers feel about the process of preparing their sermon and getting ready to preach on Sunday. And his description, and he only had a few characters to do it, went something like this. Wednesday at 11 a.m., the preacher's saying to himself, this sermon's going to rock. And then Saturday night at 11 p.m., he's saying to himself, this sermon is going to stink. Sunday morning, 9 a.m., this sermon's going to happen. That's where we're at today. This sermon is going to happen today as we continue our Real ID series. We've been talking about our real identity in Christ and the things that our identity is not found in and the things that our identity is found in. And today we're faced with the next facet of our identity in Christ. And Jesus is the one who gives us this. He is the one who spoke about this. And when Jesus first spoke these words concerning his identity and our identity, uh, he got a far less than favorable response. You want to see it? John chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So they started by not understanding this part of their identity and his identity. But it got worse. In verse 19, it says, A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. So they went from not understanding to a division. And then in verse 20, it, it goes down even further. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? And Scripture tells us, of course, others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So when Jesus talked about this facet of his identity and our identity that we're going to talk about today, there were people who didn't understand. There were people who were involved in division. There were people who said, don't listen to him. He's insane. There were other people who were saying, he can't be insane because someone who's insane can't open the eyes of the blind. What in the world did Jesus say that elicited that kind of response? John chapter 10, verse 11, this is what he said. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And he flees because he is a hired hand and he's not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they'll hear my voice. They'll become one flock with one shepherd. And for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative and I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Now, this part of our identity is unmistakable here and in other parts of the Bible. We are sheep. Of all the things we've been talking about in our identity in Christ, today we have to acknowledge we are sheep. And not too many people like being called sheep, right? In his book, They Smell Like Sheep, Lynn Anderson tells of a conversation the, that he had with a friend who suggested that since this is the 21st century, perhaps we could come up with a better metaphor for believers for followers than sheep and the whole sheep and shepherd motif. And Anderson replied, yes, I can easily come up with a better one if I can just cut about 500 pages out of my Bible. Indeed, all, all through the Scripture, this is the primary picture of the relationship between God and His people almost anywhere you turn in Scripture, some 500 times. Psalm 77, verse 20, you led your people like a flock. Psalm 78, verse 52, he led forth his own people like sheep, and he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalm 100, in verse 3, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. 
We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Sheep, it is the image God uses for his people. The image of shepherd is the image God used for prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament who led God's people. Jesus was the lamb who died and then the shepherd who guides as the chief shepherd. The apostles were told to feed his sheep. And leaders of the church under the authority of Jesus, the chief shepherd, are shepherds. Like it or not, we are sheep. It's even the basis of truth for the most beloved passage of all time in the Bible. The 23rd Psalm, written by a shepherd who said, The Lord is my shepherd. So let's just say it today. We are sheep. We are his flock. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, is I'm going to invite you today to understand and even admit a few difficult things about your identity as a sheep with Christ as the shepherd. And it starts with this simple admission. If you're a sheep, you say, I need. I need. Because to acknowledge that we are his sheep is to admit need and vulnerability. Uh, sheep don't go it alone. Uh, sheep need a shepherd, and they need the protection and security of the flock. W would you ever, in your wildest uh, imagination, choose a lamb to represent strength and self-reliance and, and courage and power and accomplishment and great leadership if you didn't already know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. You might say, I, I'm a lion, listen to me roar, but you're not going to say I'm a sheep, listen to me bah. I mean, even you watch a toddler's face as he or she responds to the questions, you know, what does the dog say? What does the bear say? How does the cow go? And maybe you remember those little, those little pull toys and it goes around. You hear the different noises of the different animals. What does a tiger do? How does the pig sound? I mean, none of us are going to say, well, the lamb is my, my favorite one. But we're sheep. Look, look briefly at how Jesus characterized sheep in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 9, verse 36, it says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd, according to Jesus. He said in chapter 7, and verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And we talked about what would happen when he died, what would happen to all of his closest followers in chapter 26 and verse 31. He quotes the Old Testament. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because on this night because of me, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. To admit that you are a sheep is to admit that you are vulnerable, that you need. Even the leaders of the church are called shepherds, and Paul warned them that the flock would need protected. You remember Acts chapter 20, verse 28? He said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, because I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not spare bearing the flock. Some of us live in uh, naivete about uh, the forces of evil in this realm and in spiritual realms and even in the teaching of evil and false doctrines that can lead to destruction. When, when Paul talked about it in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 3, he said that we pray that we'll be rescued from perverse and evil men for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful and he'll strengthen and protect you from the evil one. To say that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture, to read the 23rd Psalm, so familiar to us, and claim it for our own, to say, the Lord is my shepherd, he leads me, he makes me, he's with me, he comforts me, he provides for me, I shall not want, I am a sheep, he is my shepherd, is to say, I am vulnerable and I need. And you can't be one of his sheep without saying, I need. I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable. Well, let's take it another step. We also have to admit if we are his sheep, we have to say, I, I stray. Yeah, sometimes I stray. Now, we, we know this all too well. In fact, we sing about it, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. One of the, one of the greatest defenders of Scripture in all, of all time wrote the 119th Psalm. And the 119th Psalm is all about the glory and beauty of the Word of God. But listen to what he said in verse 176 of Psalm 119. He said, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. How many times have you, uh, have you wandered away? Did you, did you get off the path 
uh, following Jesus at all this week? This week, did you, did you choose to listen to other voices and promptings and urgings as you lived your life? Has your mind wandered to other things, even unclean things, perhaps, perhaps even during this service? I, I have a friend who um, he, he fell off the wagon this week. And I had opportunity to talk with him. I saw the pain in his face and his eyes, the disappointment in himself, the sadness of what he gave up when he fell off the wagon. And you might not have a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction or something that's so obvious, but we, we all stray sometimes, don't we? Bob Russell preached the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville for years and he told of standing out in the lobby, shaking hands with people. And one day, he, a stranger came up to him after he had talked about sin. And, and the stranger said, uh, Preacher, you talked about sin today, but I want you to know that I have not sinned for the past 30 years. And Bob kept a hold of his hand, looked him right in the eye, and said, Good, good for you. Keep it up in three more years. You'll have the record. Because Jesus did, never sinned in his 33 years on, on this earth. But the truth is we're human beings and we, we stray and to say he's the shepherd, and I'm, it, doesn't, it doesn't excuse it, but we must admit it. I need and I stray. Isaiah wrote in, in chapter 53 and verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray and each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then if I'm a sheep, I also have to say I, I mess, I, I mess up. You know, sheep are messy. I know that much. A couple of years ago, my wife Val and I toured a shearing facility in Australia, and we ate a traditional Australian breakfast there. It was uh, kind of weird to eat a breakfast with lamb at a, at a wool shed, but that's, that's what we did. And the facility we visited was called the John Darren Wool Shed. And in its heyday, they sheared 500,000 sheep a year. They still have shearing events there, but it's now also a a wedding venue of all things. And while we were there, they were setting up in the barn for a wedding, but the evidence and the aroma of sheep was still easily detected. And I'll just be honest with you, I'm not sure what I think about conducting weddings there because one thing is certain, sheep are messy. And to admit that I am a sheep is to admit my life can be messy sometimes. There's, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14 and verse 4. It's a verse I believe that I have misused and misunderstood for years. And since I've misused it for years, I'm thinking it might not hurt to misuse it one more time for you today. All right, so let me read it to you from Proverbs 14, 4. It says, where, there, where no oxen are, the manger's clean. But much revenue comes by the strength of the ox. And what I have always understood and taught that to say is that where there are no animals in the stall, there's no manure to clean out of the stall, Right? Consequently, in the church where there are people, there will always be a mess to deal with. If you don't like that, then get out of the ministry, right? However, I think what it really teaches is that where there are no oxen, there will be no, no crop. And I believe context is important. So I won't use that verse anymore. This is the last time I'll use it that way is today. Because sometimes, even when we take a verse out of context, we end up at a conclusion that's right, even if we got there the wrong way, right? Sheep are messy, we're sheep, and we have to admit the mess of our lives sometimes. We have to say, um, I am part of the problem. G.K. Chesterton used to ask the question, what's wrong with this world? Do you watch the news now? Do you look at this world and say, what is wrong with this world? And G.K. Chesterton would say, what's wrong with this world? And he would answer his own question, I am. And in our world of of screaming and finger pointing and blame casting, what, what if we at least started with ourselves? I'm not saying that we should never speak against wrong, we should. I'm not saying we shouldn't point out sin, we should. But what if we started with ourselves? What's, what's wrong with this world? I am. I, I, I need, I stray, I mess, I mess up. So, so that's the downside of this part of our identity in Christ, that, that we're sheep. And quite honestly, I'm hoping you feel a little sheepish about it this morning. But you knew that was coming sometime, right? So, so instead of just concentrating on the downside, let, let's see the beauty of this reality because there is a, there's a glorious upside 
to our sheephood, if you will. Sheep have uh, peripheral vision, I'm told, so much so that they can almost see behind themselves, but they have very poor uh, depth perception. And according to the great Wikipedia, which I call the $3 scholar, because every time I go there, they're asking for a $3 donation, sheep make up for this deficiency given that they have an excellent, fine-tuned, sensitive sense of hearing. That would be in keeping with what Jesus teaches in John. We didn't read from verse 3, but verse 3, Jesus says, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. So if I'm a sheep, I say, I, I follow. It's been like six weeks in a row. We've said it uh, every, every Sunday. Our identity is not in our politics. It's not in our ethnicity. Our identity is not in our sexuality. It's not in our ancestry. It's not in our relationships and our net worth, our talents, our title. It's not in our appearance, our achievements, abilities, reputation, intelligence, livelihood. It's not even in our biological families. Our identity is in Christ. And every one of these aspects of our identities that we've looked at is in Christ. And today, as we look at this aspect of our identity, we are His sheep, we are His flock, and sheep follow. I am follow. In fact, the uh, Apostle Peter wrote, you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. And way back in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11, it says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead the nursing ewes. That's why I love our purpose statement that we are helping people become lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. That's what sheep do. They, they follow, and we're sheep. But I not only bring myself to say, I follow, but to say, I belong. In case you haven't noticed, the word sheep can denote singular or plural. Now you, you can get a little more specific, specific if you want. If you want to talk about a female sheep, you can speak of the you. Uh, lamb. My, my dad used to say that he knew a young preacher who was preaching his first sermon, and he came to that text that says, God, God said, take a ewe lamb, E-W-E, and this preacher said, God said, take an ewe lamb, but it's a ewe lamb. That's a female sheep, and a, a male would be a ram. If it's a castrated male, it would be a, a weather uh, a sheep. If it's a, not a full-grown sheep, it would be called a lamb, but we're all called sheep, and that's singular and plural. I am a sheep, but we are sheep, and, and we belong to the flock. And again, this identity in Christ is not merely individual identity. It's collective because we are a flock, and there's this beautiful passage in Psalm 107, verse 41. It says, He sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction, and makes his families like a flock. And this is so important that the shepherd pursues us when we're gone away from the flock, when we're not in the fold. In Matthew 18, 12, Jesus said, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them is going astray, doesn't he leave the ninety and nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is strained? And that's why one of our uh, three key words here at Mount Gilead is gather. We, we gather and we grow and, and we go. Gather. And I'll never apologize for it. I agree with those who say Sunday morning church is not enough. It's not. That's why we're encouraging with the mantra to increase our service by Sunday plus two. You, you gather here, and then you join a group, and you serve on a team. That's a good start. But gathering around the Lord's table and being together as a flock on the first day of the week is indispensable. And just quite honestly, it, it grieves me that in our culture that's becoming increasingly less common. And I, that comes with great cost, let me tell you. Uh, for years, I, I've watched your eyes roll uh, as, as I talked about my love of automobiles here. But, but let me just admit something. Let, let me admit that my love affair with cars and trucks also extends to toys. So, like, I'm just going to confess today, I, I play with toys. 
Uh, I have these little RC cars. I have some one-tenth uh, scale racing cars that can run 70 mile an hour in the church parking lot, and they have. In fact, they've run around the new building when it was just cement. You think there's just scripture written under the carpet, so there's burnout marks from those toy cars, and they secretly try to stay away from the video cameras while I did it. So I have these racing cars that run 70 mile an hour, but I have a vehicle that can jump ramps, and, and I have some four-wheel drive trucks that are outfitted to climb rough terrain. And you can go ahead, you can make fun of me all you want. It's my hobby, and it's cheaper than the real thing, and I want to keep doing it. So, so I have several friends who are into this too, and I'm not going to out them here today because I don't have their, their permission except for, for one of them. Last year, whenever we could, we got together to race, drive, climb, play, build, or repair our vehicles. Even in very busy times, we squeezed in the time, sometimes even at night. And as the, the onset of winter came and it got, uh, it got colder, um, we were mourning the onset of winter and eagerly awaiting the coming of spring so we could get those cars out and, and play again. My friend uh, John Ward owned the remote control store in Mooresville, and so on my lunch hour I would drop by or when I left the office in the evening, and there was always, always, always a group of guys there uh, talking about the newest products or practices, showing off their newest builds or RC rigs, and just enjoying the hobby and fellowship and all things RC. Unfortunately, people started purchasing too much stuff online, and the revenue declined, and John made the difficult but wise decision to close that store. And there was a core group of us who would go in there all the time in those last few weeks that the store was open, uh, and we, we were just mourning the closing of that store. I mean, we were just in mourning for days, even as we purchased all the inventory at large discounts. <laughs> and so, man, every time we get together shaking, oh, I can't believe the store's closed. You know, what are we going to do? We can't get together here. And, and I met all kinds of new people doing, doing that kind of stuff. And, and we'd say, that's okay. We'd tell ourselves, that, that's okay. We can still get together and work on our, our, and run our vehicles and our, and our cars and our trucks. We love our RC vehicles. We don't have to have a store to play with our RC cars. And then the warm weather came again. Do you know how many times that I have gotten with any of my friends to run RC cars this year in the warm weather with now winter approaching again? One time. I was thinking about that the other day, and it hit me that the only thing that changed was the regular gathering place and practice. Do you know what I've just described to you? The demise of a church. Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus more than anything. Some of my friends do too, but I don't need church, at least not every Sunday. I'll pop in when I need something or when I'm not busy or next time I think about it or when there's not camping or sports or whatever it is that I'm into. And sometimes I can get it online and on TV, that's a better deal anyway. And soon that's not just the attitude of our culture, it becomes the wave even of our church culture and, and we stray. But it's not the demise of church culture in America it's not just that. It also contributes to less knowledge and relationship with Jesus. It causes minimized fellowship, less focused attention on Christ, sheep leaving the fold, unfamiliarity with the voice of the great shepherd, and even a decline in the encouragement to good works and synergies and a voice and a service to the world and certainly to our local community. See, I need you and you need me and we need each other. It's the way the shepherd made us. We say, because we're sheep, I belong. Can you, can you imagine the sheep saying to the shepherd, oh, I love you and I'll follow you, but I don't want to be or need to be in the fold. The, the flock is an inconvenient, unnecessary encumbrance. I'll follow from a distance. Would you hear his voice again? Know that I have made you and not you yourselves. You are my people and the sheep of my pasture. When we talked about how we're all parts in the body. He said, when one part rejoices, all the parts rejoice. When one part weeps, uh, all the parts weep. This week, two of our members uh, passed away. Jerry Perkheiser went home to be with the Lord. We lift up his uh, family in our prayers. And last night, Treva Richer uh, passed away. We want to pray for her family too. See, we're a flock. We're, we're sheep, but we are sheep in the flock. So, so we've made this... Uh, this subtle but important intentional shift, and we, we did it last week. 
that our identity in Christ isn't an individual identity alone, it's collective. So when I say I'm a saint, I'm not just a saint, I'm in a throng of all his saints. When I say I'm a child of God, I'm, I'm a child of God, but I also have millions of siblings in a massive family. When I say I'm a slave of Christ, I am, but I join the ranks of those who serve him. If, if I'm his workmanship, I shine along with multiple uh, trophies of his grace. And I say today, I'm a sheep, but I'm in his fold and part of his flock with all the other sheep. And when Jesus goes after a lost sheep, it's with the intent of finding them and helping them and bringing them back to the fold. The, the prophet Ezekiel wrote, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among the scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day, safe in the fold. I follow. I belong. One more. I produce. We don't usually think about this when we talk about the great shepherd and us being the sheep, right? I, I produce. A sheep can produce up to 30 pounds of wool a year. Now, when it comes to producing as sheep of God's hand, we don't produce in order to be saved. We produce because we are saved. And as, as we noted recently, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved uh, for good works. Jesus said to one of his sheep, who also became one of his shepherds, Peter, if you'll love me, feed my sheep. Because when sheep are fed and cared for, they're greatly productive. And, and that's why we see this metaphor, not only since the beginning, but also in the end, where Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, and he appears. Remember Matthew 25, 32? All the nations, all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put his sheep on the right and the goats on the left. See, if you don't like this sheep thing, you can just be a goat, right? And you know the gist of Matthew 25. What did you do with what he entrusted you with? How did you spend his opportunities and resources? How did you minister to the least of these? Or as one preacher says, the last, the least, the lonely, the lost, and the left out. And most of all, to other sheep, believers in that parable. What did you do with those who were hungry and those who were thirsty and sick and in prison and in need? And in this parable, the saved are the sheep and the lost are the goats. I want to show you something real quick. Remember the prophecy in Micah chapter 5 of the birth of Jesus when they, when they came to King Herod and they're talking about it and it found out that the, that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter 5. I think about verse 2. But you go two verses later to verse 4. This is what it says. He will arise and shepherd his flock. He will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. We have a prophecy even at his birth. And then we have a prophecy of his death, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shears, so he didn't open his mouth. And then we have the reality of the resurrection in Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. He calls you by name and you can learn to know his voice he goes ahead of you you know him and he knows you and according to John 10 he calls you to be saved and to go in and out and find pasture and he gives you not only eternal life but abundant life and he lays down his life for the sheep but if you're a sheep you have to say I need I stray I mess I follow I belong I produce I'm saved. So would you hear his voice right now? Because this aisle is open. The prayer room, just outside these doors, second door to the left is, is open. There's somebody there waiting for you. The baptistry is, is warm. Forgiveness is offered. The spirit is poised. We are all for you. God is for you. The angels are ready. And it's time for you to come home. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time. He wants you in his fold, and so do we. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Let's pray. Father, 
thank you for being and providing a shepherd for us. We, we are your people and the sheep of your pasture, and we need, and we stray, and we're a mess. But we will follow. Lord, we will belong, and we will produce. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I let you go, real quick, just a couple of quick things. Jen mentioned this already, but we're going to try to read through the whole Bible uh, 24 hours a day uh, between the 21st and the 28th. We had 288 slots, and I think about 200 of those have been filled up. So we still need people to do that. Maybe you've already taken one. You can take another one. But we really want to accomplish that, and time is drawing near. So don't forget on your way up to, out to sign up for that. We also have invitation cards for opening day. They look like this. They're available at the Welcome Center for you to invite uh, friends and family and loved ones to opening day. We want to encourage you to do that. Finally, I want to mention something about the hurricane victims. Several of you have been asking about that. I want you to know that we regularly support an organization called IDES, I-D-E-S, International Disaster Emergency Service. And you can know that whenever a tragedy like this takes place, some of your dollars, God's dollars that you have given, are already going to meet some of those needs. So we're prepared for that ahead of time. But occasionally, there are disasters where we want to do even a little more uh, above and beyond. And I think this is one of those uh, times for these last two hurricanes. And we have a Timothy who preaches in South Carolina and we have some avenues by which to help people in Florida as well. And so also at the Welcome Center today, there is a box, and we're prepared to receive donations uh, for that as well. So if you would like to help in a greater way than what we're already doing, th there is a place available uh, for you to do that at the, at the Welcome Center today, and we encourage you to do so. So go have a great week this week. Thank you for being here today.